everyone and welcome to this video. Now last night I found myself testing Windows 8. At least I found myself testing the release preview which is going to be actually <coughs> the well it is the closest to what Windows 8 is going to be. Now unfortunately in that process I did lose a lot of dignity. But don't worry you will be seeing this video soon. I, I will, of course, be uploading it, so um, don't worry. You'll, you'll not be left in the dark as to what Windows 8 is all about. Unfortunately, though, I do think Microsoft kind of blew it with this one. They seem to be moving away from the desktop machine. <coughs> um, and to be honest, I don't think the market is quite ready for that. Like I said, though, I did lose a lot of dignity in the process of testing Windows 8. So I've decided to put some of that dignity back by test driving a new distribution of Linux. But before that, first I want to talk to you about a company that was really quite successful in the 1980s. This company is of course Commodore, Commodore International. Now, <coughs> Commodore have been going since about the 50s where um, Commodore owner Jack Tremiel was, he was an Auschwitz survivor and he actually escaped, he was a Polish immigrant, he escaped and for a while drove taxi cabs in New York. Now as he was doing that, he actually used, had a business setting up typewriters and repairing them. Um, however, he signed a deal with a Czechoslovakian company to manufacture their designs in Canada. And he moved to Toronto to start production. And by the late 1950s, there was a wave of Japanese machines had forced North American typewriter companies like Commodore to cease business. However, Jack Tremiel turned to adding machines. And in 1955, the company was formally incorporated as Commodore Business Machines, CBM, in Canada. Now, in 1962, Commodore went public at the New York Stock Exchange under the name of Commodore International Limited. By the late 1960s, history repeated itself when Japanese firms started producing and exporting adding machines. The company's main investor and chairman, Irving Gold, suggested that Tremiel travel to Japan to understand how to compete. Instead, he returned with new ideas to produce electronic calculators, which were just coming on the market. Commodore soon had a profitable calculator line and was one of the more popular brands in the early 1970s, producing both con consumer as well as scientific and programmable calculators. However, <coughs> in 1975, Texas Instruments was the main supplier of calculator parts and they entered the market directly and put a line of machines priced at less than the Commodore's cost for the parts. Commodore obtained an infusion of cash from gold, which Tremiel used beginning in 1976 to purchase several second source chip suppliers, including MOS Technology Incorporated, in order to ensure his supply. He agreed to buy MOS, which was having troubles of its own, only on the condition that its chip designer Chuck Peddle joined Commodore directly as a head of engineering. Once Chuck Peddle had taken over the engineering at Commodore, he convinced Jack Tremiel that calculators were already a dead end and that they would turn their attention instead to home computers. Peddle packaged his single board computer design in a metal case al along with full travel QWERTY keyboard monochrome monitor and a tape recorder for programming data storage to produce the Commodore PET 
and here is where our story begins. Oh, isn't that magical? There's a picture of the Commodore Pet on the screen. Now, Pet was actually an acronym which stood for Personal Electronic Transactor, whatever that means. Now, from Pet's 1977 debut, Commodore would be a com computer company. Now, Commodore had been reorganised a year before into Commodore International Limited. Lucky them, being a limited company. And they moved their financial headquarters to the Bahamas, and their operational headquarters went to West Chest Chester in Pennsylvania, near to the MOS technology site. <coughs> the operational headquarters, where research and development of new products occurred, retained the name Commodore Business Machines Incorporated. The PET computer line was used primarily in schools due to its tough all-metal construction. Some models were <coughs> labelled the teacher's pet, but did not compete well in the home setting where the graphics and sound were important. This was addressed with the intro introduction of the VIC-20 in 1981, which was introduced to the cost of US $299 US dollars and sold in retail stores. Commodore took out aggressive ads featuring William Shatner, asking co consumers why buy just a video game? The strategy worked and the VIC-20 became the first computer to ship more than 1 million units. A total of 2.5 million units were sold over the machine's lifetime. In 1982, Commodore introduced the Commodore 64 as a successor to the VIC-20. And yes, that unit there is mine. I do have an example of it. It's kind of good. Thanks to a well-designed set of chips designed by MOS Technology, the Commodore 64, also referred to as the C64, possessed remarkable sound and graphics for its time, and is often credited with starting the computer demo scene. Its, U its 595 US dollar price was high compared with that of the VIC-20, but it was still much less expensive than any other 64K computer on the market. Early C64 ads boasted, you can't buy a better computer at twice the price. Australian ads used a tune speaking the words, are you keeping up with the Commodore? Because the Commodore is keeping up with you. In 1983, Tremiel decided to focus on market share and cut the price of the VIC-20 and the C64 dramatically, starting what would be called the Home Computer War. TI, or Texas Instruments, responded by cutting prices on its TI-99-4A, which had been introduced in 1981. Soon, there was an all-out price war involving Commodore, TI, Atari, and practically every other vendor other than Apple computers. By the end of this conflict, Commodore had shipped somewhere around 22 million C64s, making the C64 computer the best selling of all time. Commodore's board of directors were as impacted as anyone else by the price spiral and decided that they wanted out. An internal power struggle resulted. In January 1984, Tremiel resigned. He founded a new company, Tremiel Technology, spelt T-R-A-M-E-L so that people would pronounce it correctly, and hired away a number of Commodore engineers to begin work on the next-gen computer design. Now it was left to the remaining com Commodore management to salvage the company's fortunes and plan for the future. It did so by buying a small startup company called Amiga Corporation. In August 1984, for $25 million, or 12.8 million in cash and 550,000 in common shares. Which became a subsidiary of Commodore, called Commodore-Amiga Inc. Commodore bought this new 32 computer design, initially codenamed Lorraine, later dubbed the Amiga 1000, to market in the fall of 1985 for 1,295 US dollars. But Tremiel had beaten Commodore to the punch. His design was 95% completed by June, which fuels speculation that his engineers had taken technology with them from Commodore. 
In July 1984, he bought the consumer side of T Atari Inc. from Warner Communications, which allowed him to strike back and release the Atari ST earlier in 1985 for about $800. During development in 1983, Amiga had exhausted venture capital and was desperate for more finances. J Minor had, and company had approached former employee employer Atari and the Warner owned Atari had paid Amiga to continue development work. In return Atari was to get one year exclusive use of the design as a video games console. After one year Atari would have the right to add a keyboard and market the complete Amiga computer. <coughs> the Atari Museum has acquired the Atari Amiga contract and Atari engineering logs revealing that the Atari Amiga was originally des designated as the 1850XLD. As Atari was heavily involved with Disney at the time, it was later codenamed Mickey, and the 256K memory expansion board was codenamed Mini. The following year, Tremiel discovered that Warner Communications wanted to sell Atari, which was rumoured to be losing about $10,000 a day. Interested in Atari's overseas manufacturing and worldwide distribution network for his new computer, he approached Atari and entered negotiations. After several on-again, off-again talks with Atari in May and June 1984, Tremiel had secured his funding and bought Atari's consumer division, which included the console and home computer department, in July. As more execs and researchers left Commodore after the announcement to join up with Tremiel's new company, Atari Corp, Commodore followed by filing lawsuits against former engineers for theft or trade secrets in late July. This was intended, in effect, to bar Tremiel from releasing his new computer. One of Tremiel's first acts after for forming Atari Corporation was to fire most of Atari's remaining staff and to cancel almost all ongoing projects in order to review their continued viability. In late July and early August, Tremiel representatives discovered that the original Amiga contract from the previous fall. Seeing a chance to gain some leverage, Tremiel immediately used the contract to counter sue Commodore through its new subsidiary Amiga August 13th. The Amiga crew, still suffering for serious financial problems, had sought more monetary support from investors that entire spring. At around the same time that Tremiel was in negotiations with Atari, Amiga entered into discussions with Commodore. The discussions ultimately led to Commodore's intentions to purchase Amiga outright, which would, from Commodore's viewpoint, cancel any outstanding contracts, including Atari's. This interpretation is what Tremiel used to counter sue, and sought damages in an injunction to bar Amiga, and effectively Commodore, from producing any resembling technology. This was an attempt under Commodore's new acquisition, and the source of its next generation of computers, useless. The resulting court case lasted for several years, with both companies releasing their respective products. By March of 1987, they'd settled out of court, with all suits against Tremiel's engineers dropped. His business as war tactics had succeeded again. Throughout the life of the ST and Amiga platforms, a ferocious Atari Commodore rivalry raged. <clears throat> While this rivalry was in many ways a holdover from the days when the Commodore 64 had first challenged the Atari 800, among others, in a series of scathing television commercials, the events leading up to the launch of the ST and Amiga only served to alienate the fans of each computer who fought vitriol vitriolic holy wars on the question of which platform was superior. This was reflected in the sales numbers for the two flat platforms until the release of the Amiga 500 in 1987, which led the Amiga sales to exceed the ST by about 1.5 to 1, despite reaching the market later. However, 
the battle was in vain, as neither platform captured a significant share of the world computer market, and only the Apple Macintosh would survive the industry-wide shift to Microsoft Windows running on PC clones. In the 1970s and early 1980s, the computer press had often sought Commodore, one of the industry's leading players, <clears throat> and its colourful management for information despite the company's notorious reputation. One columnist stated in April 1981 that the microcomputer industry abounds with horror stories describing the way that Commodore treats its dealers and customers. The BIC-20 and C64, although aggressively marketed, were arguably more successful because of their price than their marketing. After Tremiel's departure, Commodore executives shied away from the mass advertising and other marketing ploys, fearful of repeating past mistakes. Commodore also retreated from its earlier strategy of selling its computers to discount outlets and toy stores, and now favoured authorised dealers. By the late 1980s, per the personal computer market had become dominated by the IBM PC and the Apple Macintosh platforms. Commodore's marketing effects, efforts for the Amiga were less competitive and seemed half-hearted and unfocused. The company also concentrated on consumer products that would not see a demand for another few years, including a digital TV system called the CDTV. As early as 1986, the mainstream press was predicting Commodore's demise. Nevertheless, the Philadelphia Enquirer's top, 10, uh, top 100 business annual continued to list several of the Commodore executives among the highest paid in the region. <clears throat> in the early 1990s, CBM continued selling Amigas with 7 to 1400 uh, MHz processors. 68 1000 family CPUs. Even though the Amiga 3000 with the 25 MHz 68030 was in the market by that time, when PCs with 33486s, high color graphics cards, and Sound Blaster are compatible sound cards offered comparable and eventually higher performance, albeit at a higher price. By way of contrast, when introduced in 1985, the Amiga had compared favourably against the 286-based systems with EGA graphics and rudimentary sound capabilities that frequently cost two to three times as much. In 1992, the production of the A600 seemed like a backward move. It replaced the A500, yet it removed numeric keypad, Zorro expansion slots, SCSI capability and un other functionality in favour of PCMCIA and theoretically cost reduced design. It was basically unexpandable and lasted less than a year. Productivity developers moved to the PC and Macintosh while the console wars took over the gaming market. David Pleasance, managing director of Commodore UK, described the A600 as a complete and utter screw up. Smith, 1994. In late 1992, Amiga hardware began to reach parity with PCs with the release of the A4000 and the A1200 computers, which featured an improved graphics chipset, the AGA. By this point, both the IBM and Apple Macintosh had a much larger market share than the Amiga platform. As software developers shifted to these platforms, the Amiga lost value for mainstream consumers. The custom-designed and custom-built AGA chipset set also cost Commodore considerably more than the commodity chips used in IBM PCs, further reducing Commodore's profit margins. Common wisdom was that even though the AGA clearly improved upon the original chipset, OTS, it never returned to Amiga the clear dominance of multimedia computing that it had once promised. Software piracy has also been given by trade publications and user groups as a reason for Amiga's demise, but this view is controversial. In 1994, the Maker Break system, according to Pleasance, was a 32-bit CD-ROM-based game console, the CD32, but it was not sufficiently profitable to put Commodore back, on, back in the black.
In the early 1990s, all servicing and warranty repairs were outsourced to Wang Laboratories. By 1994, only its operations in Germany and the United Kingdom were still profitable. Commodore declared bankruptcy on April the 29th, 1994, and its assets were liquidated. The former site of Commodore's operational headquarters in Westchester, Pennsylvania, now houses the headquarters and the broadcast studios of the leading ca cable retailer QVC Incorporated. A wee bit, tad bit of information. On November the 26th, 2004, QVC became the first retailer to sell a DTV, which is basically a C64 and a joystick that was designed by Jerry Ellsworth. The company's computer systems, especially the C64 and the Amiga series, retain a cult following among their users, years after its demise. Let's fast forward to 2010, where something absolutely amazing happened. The iPhone 4. It was the first iPhone with a fact. Wait a minute, that's the wrong picture. Right, okay, let's do this properly now. In 2010, a company was founded called Commodore USA LLC. Now, they are a computer company based in Pompano Beach in Florida with additional facilities in Fort Launder Lauderdale, Florida. Commodore USA LLC was founded in April 2010. The company's goal is to sell a new line of PCs using the classic Commodore and Amiga name brands of personal computers. Having licensed the Commodore brand from Commodore Licensing BV on August 25th, 2010, and the, Com the Amiga brand from Amiga Inc on August the 31st, 2010. <clears throat> Commodore USA consistently focused on building an alternative operating system, preferring Linux. It had previously been claimed that their machines support every operating system available from Ubuntu, specifically, to Windows, and even Mac OS X x86. But disclaiming that they do not and will not sell Mac OS X. Commodore USA's online store sold Microsoft Windows separately and bundled Linux and their keyboard computers. Later, Commodore USA announced that they would officially support, develop, and ship their computers with ADOS, whatever that is, but shifted their focus to re on redesigning Linux as an Amiga Workbench 5 and Workbench 10, or X but decided to name it Commodore OS and dropped all plans of making it resemble an Amiga-like operating system due to additional legal proceedings. Examples of announced products that appear to have been cancelled are Invectus and Amigo. The Commodore USA website was redesigned and an interactive forum was launched at the same time. High-end Amiga PC designs were posted on the website. The company licensed the Commodore brand from Commodore Licensing BV and it also licensed the Amiga brand from Amiga shortly afterwards. Now Commodore USA has been criticised for altering previously announced plans threatening legal action against an OS newswriter's article and mistakenly attempting to obtain licensing from Commodore Licensee on a, uh, on authorised to sub-license. Commodore USA has been alleged to have used various images, artwork and designs without the permission of the original authors, though it has been confirmed that in some examples this has been due to image authors leaving the Amiga user community without leaving contact details regarding their artwork. Further controversy surrounding the company's image use policy was revolved around the alleged photographs of the C64X assembly line in China, revealed to have been old promotional images for a facility in Augsburg, owned by Fujitsu. Some of Commodore USA's announced products have been cancelled since their announcement due to intellectual property disagreement, most notably concerning the rights of licensor Amiga Incorporated with regards to the possible use of ADOS in future Amiga systems from Commodore USA. <coughs> Others have been simply cancelled as the business plan evolves away from their sector of the market. Notable examples include attacking competition, use of ADOS kickstarts instead of original ones, as well as rebranding Mint under the Commodore OS name.
Also, there is no support for a free version of Commodore OS. Product properties and product specs have several times changed from announcements. Contrary to their website's past models page, they're not related in any way to Commodore or Amiga models of the past. And I want to reiterate that. This Commodore today is has no relation at all whatsoever to the original Commodore company. And they produced their own, their VIC, the VEX, sorry, C64X um, Amiga models by changing cases with the same hardware and mixing low and high end series and inventing new names. More or less, it's twice priced, same hardware repeated in different cases with different stickers or engravements. It's as expensive as high end PC or Macs and it's bundled with beta OS that should be free. And that OS obviously is Mint Linux. <coughs> Lance Ullinoff, writing in PC Mag, criticised the new, new Commodore 64 as a non too cheap imitation of the real thing, criticising it for using modern components. Commodore USA has responded to this position by pointing out the high cost of research in developing original chipsets and the relative expense or lack of mass market software support for, their, for other. CPU ISAs such as a power architecture or the Motorola 68000 family. Commodore USA has attempted to address these concerns by announcing Commodore OS intended to be developed to support and be released with Commodore USA systems. Their new Amiga product line is not compatible with the original Commodore Amiga systems, including the operating system Amiga OS, which is in fact developed by a separate company. Commodore USA originally intended to develop an Aros to be bundled with their Amiga systems. However, this plan was later publicly discarded by the CEO, Barry Altman. So exactly what have the new Commodore company been up to since their launch in 2010? Well, first off, there's this. Based on the Cybernet computer, this is the Commodore Phoenix, and it is a computer keyboard computery thing resembling an updated style of the C64. And like I said, it was originally designed by the by Cybernet as a space saving workstation. If you want to see videos of Cybernet, B Bishop PCM and UXW Bell both have one. I would like one, but don't have one. The VIC product line is a group of keyboard computers, very much unlike the original, with original Commodore function keys. There's a VIC Slim, which is a computer that's the same size as most extended keyboards, but uses a relatively slow Intel Atom CPU. And that's the one that you see on your screen right now. And then of course, there's the VIC Pro, a keyboard computer with the same external appearance as the Phoenix mentioned above, with a built-in touchpad, memory card reader, two fans, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Kidding on. This was originally designed and manufactured by Cybernet uh, as a space-saving workstation. And this is the point where you're all going to scream at your computer screen, Jay, stop using recycled images! I'm not. This is the new Commodore C60, well, the Commodore 64. The Commodore C64X. And this is a flagship product for Commodore USA LLC. And it's partially redesigned an updated Commodore 64 case named the Commodore 64X. The machine looks almost exactly like the original C64, except with a slightly updated keyboard and power supply. The base model has an Intel Atom processor and an NVIDIA ION2 graphics card. Well, the top version, which was released on August 13th, 2011, called the C64 X Extreme, features an Intel Core i7 CPU with eight gigs of RAM and a three terabyte hard disk. That's more powerful than my computer, so it is using the Intel Sandy Bridge chipset. There is also a bare bones version of the C64X, which comes without a motherboard, power supply, or optical and hard drive that encourage hobbyist enthusiasts to install their preferred Mini ATX motherboard. Personally, between you and me, I'd probably go ahead and install those other components as well.
And now we come to the piece de resistance, the new Amiga. Now, when I first saw this computer, I was shown it by YouTube user Easy Posse. Um, I burst out laughing because it looks nothing like an Amiga. Its architecture is nothing like an Amiga. And its operating system is also nothing like an Amiga. Yes, it will emulate it. But then again, I could do that on my common Mac. Now, as of November the 11th, 2011, Armistice Day, Commodore USA released beta versions of Commodore OS, a Linux Mint-based operating system, to be used throughout its product range. It is a media center operating system bundled with a variety of free open source software. The full version of this beta operating system is available only with systems purchased from Commodore USA. It does support emulation of some previous Commodore operating systems. And this now brings me nicely on to why I even made this video in the first place. Now, you can download a free version of Commodore OS Vision from the new Commodore USA website. Anyone can do so, but be advised that you will actually need a torrent downloader, such as uTorrent or BitTorrent or anything like that, to actually do so. Now, I did actually download this operating system, and here, coming up, is my review of it running in VMware. So here it is, Commodore Vision. Now let's go and start it up. Now, as you can see, it's um, the pretty much standard form grub menu. And like a lot of uh, distributions of Linux, it does come with Memtest x86, which is, um, I must admit, quite a nice addition. So let's go into Commodore OS Vision. As you can see it has a very similar, well it's first off it's based on Linux Mint and second off it looks a lot like Ubuntu starting and that's because it's based on Ubuntu. Now the first thing you'll see is quite a dated looking login screen along with them. Um, Universal access, which is kind of nice. Plus, you've got this um, fancy animated twirling mouse pointer. Now, I'm just going to change the language to United Kingdom. And you can choose from different uh, GUIs. Personally, I'm going to choose no, because that is the default one, plus, it's great. So it keeps reminding me to install proprietary drivers, but as I'm running it in VMware, there really are no proprietary drivers. And if you just give it a wee minute to load up, it'll load up a dock. Now here is basically what looks like a regular Ubuntu desktop. And that's because basically it is. You've even got CPU usage down here, which uh, that doesn't have. And to be honest, it looks a lot better than the new Ubuntu interface. And very much like, uh, very much unlike Windows 8, it doesn't assume that the user is a complete idiot. However, it does assume that the user has got very high tolerance levels on their eyes. Because look at the color scheme. It's just garish, it's bright blue. I mean, bright blue is brilliant, I love the colour, but to be honest, when you're staring at it for long periods of time on a screen, it can get a wee bit tiresome and your eyes can go funny. I do like the 8-bit um, style sound sets, though. That's pretty good. It does come with LibreOffice, which is a really quite a handy addition just like Ubuntu, and the page at least shows up white, so that is a wee bit of a sign uh, that is a wee bit of a sanctuary. You also get Mozilla Firefox, <coughs> however it says only version 9.0. And if you go to About, you get some of those old style fonts. Have a look at this. 
Mozilla Firefox for Commodore OS. And it'll just work like regular Firefox. And because I've installed the restricted extras, let's go and have a wee look at YouTube. Sounds like a good pair of speakers you have there, Billy. <coughs> so, I mean, YouTube runs pretty well. Now, this machine has a terminal, like all Linux distros, and look at it! It's very retro. Basically looks like the console screen for the Commodore 64. And, because it's based on Ubuntu, it actually will work with the Ubuntu repositories. So, if I go sudo apt get install vlc, just drop my password in there. Um, oh, vlc is already installed to the nearest version. We have VLC Media Player. So, um, <coughs> that'll go in the way and install that. And while that's doing that, let's have a look at some of the other features this system has, which sets it apart. It has a whole bunch of emulators. So you've got the Commodore 64, 128, C8M2, Commodore Pet. Let's have a look at that. Very retro. And if I had any ROMs, I would be able to run ROMs on here. And that's the same with the C64 emulator. So it's now emulating a C64 with a broken keyboard. That's nice. Very authentic. And it will also emulate the Amiga if I had a ROM and the C128. But not only will it emulate uh, Commodores, obviously you can install any other emulators on here that are compatible with uh, Debian, but this also comes with Wine pre-installed. So I can just uh, get a Windows disk and insert it straight in here. So um, let's try that. Let's get a copy of... Um, let's try and cart to 98. Multimedia currently requires Windows and audio video. 
compression drivers. But it's actually started to work. Even if the sound is a wee bit dodgy. But there we have it, Microsoft Windows emulation. There is also on here, there is also a DOSBox emulator, as well as <coughs> PC operating system emulator, or known better to you and I as VirtualBox. So it's really quite good. This, I would say, is a version of Linux for kind of geeky people like me, people who like things nostalgic. Basically, what they have done here is <coughs> taken all the members of the Packard Bell fan club and said, I know what we'll do, we'll create an operating system for you guys. Personally though, I think the blue is a wee bit much, however, it does enable you to change the theme. So let's have a wee look at what themes I can actually change it to. Um, however, I must admit, I do like the ISO maker, which is um, a must-have tool. If... Um, <coughs> It's a must-have tool in case you wanted to run a CD in a virtual PC. There is also <coughs> CD, DVD burner, ISO master, oops, super user file manager, Amiga Opus-like file manager. So when I originally saw the Commodore, the new Commodore Amiga, I just burst out laughing because basically what I saw was a PC with Amiga written on it. And yes, it kind of still is that, but paired with this operating system, it is actually really a lot better than that. <laughs> It does have a lot of Commodore-esque applications and the desktop theme is very Commodore-esque and it is really quite good. Oh, look at this Blu-ray player. So um, <clears throat> this is an operating system designed again for people like me, people who like computers with optical drives in them, people who want computers to be computers which is unfortunately the thing that Apple and Microsoft seem to be shying away from. They seem to think that all we want are tablets. And that's not necessarily the case. Yes, I would like a tablet, but I would like a tablet to supplement my computers, not as my main computer. I still have need for a very powerful home desktop machine. And for them to think otherwise, well, to be honest, they could be losing custom. It is, it is really, really, really stupid and blind of them to think that they can just force things on us. We're not going to really stand for it. At the end of the day, ugh. it is just literally, I don't know, personally, I like this system. And if Microsoft Windows, I mean Mac OS 10.8 is really good at the moment. <clears throat> but if it goes the same way as Windows 8, I do believe this system will be getting a new user. Look at this. You even have NDIS wrappers, enable you, enabling you to use Windows wireless drivers. Now this in the past has not been the most reliable, but I can imagine with time it will become more reliable. Really, they've really, really done very well. And if you don't like the Commodore style theme, well, just use a different one. There we go. You can you can make it look a lot less garish. See what I mean? Absolutely brilliant. And anyway, on that note, I really like this system. I'm looking forward to it um, actually going live. 
life, I hope. Um, do you know what? I think it might be installed in my cube before the year is out. I really, really do. Because I really like this system a heck of a lot. I think it is that good. You can download your own copy from the Commodore website. Um, however, be advised that you will need to use a torrent. Look at that. It refreshes the desktop if um, it's not actually displaying properly. I do like And it's talking to me. Now, I really do like this. Do you know, I think it is really quite good. It's really refreshing to see an operating system that has actually been written by people who know what we like, rather than the marketing department wanting to shove brand new things on us, whether it's good or not. I really, really, really do like this. And on that note, I think it's time to end this video. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Instructions on how to do so will follow.